Don't you just love it when eBay parcels are packaged adequately? Too bad it happens so rarely. Anyway, let me introduce you to a Keithley 410A Pico M meter with the best rotary switch that has ever been produced. Did you know that one YouTube channel called Knob Feel? That guy surely would approve of this. In the upper right corner there's all the power supply business happening. If you have a broken unit you can check the manual online. There are a lot of voltages printed in there that you can check as a first step. On the back side you can switch the recorder output between 1 milliamp and 1 volt for full scale. In the bottom right corner there is an assembly with a matched pair of isolated gate MOSFETs. If one breaks, don't switch one, switch both at least or the whole assembly. Then there's this solid wire mounted on Teflon posts going all the way to the front to the nice big rotary switch where we have 10 times 10 to the negative 4 selected right now. That equals 1 milliamp full scale. And that's the highest range that this meter can measure. In this range we have a fairly ordinary resistor value selected. But as we go down to the ranges for smaller currents, the resistor values get bigger and bigger, until finally in the lowest range we get a 100 mega ohm 1% resistor in its glass encapsulation. Isn't that a bit counterintuitive? We want to measure minuscule barely existing currents with extremely large value resistors? Here is how it works. It'll only take two minutes. The full schematic is available publicly, but it's a barely legible scan of an old document. So here's a simplified version of it for a quick explanation. The semiconductors form an op-amp. The current that you want to measure is introduced via these two terminals. But because our op-amp arrangement is equipped with a negative feedback loop, it is going to try everything it can to equalize the voltages at both inputs. So as soon as we introduce the current that we want to measure into the inverting input of our op-amp, it'll have a higher voltage than the non-inverting input. Now the op-amp does its thing and tries to restore equilibrium by lowering its output voltage. It does that exactly until all the current that we introduce flows through the feedback loop, because then the voltage at both inputs is exactly the same again. But how does this overly complicated mechanism help us to measure extremely small currents? Well, this is the clever part. With the rotary switch we can select the value of this feedback resistor. So for our very small current we can use an appropriately huge value resistor. In order to make all the current flow through that thing, the op-amp has to pull really hard aka produce a large negative voltage. And that is something we can measure easily. Let's see if that's actually true. The input connector is implemented as a coaxial UHF socket. And it took a bit of rummaging around to find something that actually fit. A big mixed bag of coaxial connectors, even some triaxial. 
Just gotta find some good cable for that. Luckily, here's a UHF to BNC coupling. And here's a BNC to 4mm banana jack coupling. But now we have taken two steps downward in terms of EMI protection, leakage current and triboelectric noise. Meaning the UHF standard is the best performer in these disciplines, BNC is not quite as good and 4mm banana jacks are not as good as BNCs. And that will cause problems later when we are closing in on the nanoamp range. Quick function accuracy test with this adjustable current source at a Keithley 2000 in series. Looks okay to me. Time to whip out another awesome toy. I don't know about the original purpose of this thing, but if nothing else, the handmade acrylic enclosure makes it worth having around, I think. It's probably not what one would call a decade, but it has a couple of high value resistors in it, and with those black shortcut plugs, you can configure custom values. The blue ones are ohmite 1% resistors between 1 mega ohm and 5 giga ohms. They cost about $6 each. And the crown jewel on the right is an ohmite 1% resistor too, evacuated and glass encapsulated with an outworldly value of 100 giga ohms. That one alone costs 55 bucks. And obviously now I want to know if it has the claimed value. First attempt at verifying that. I'm going to put 100 volts exactly across the resistor and connect my picoammeter in series with it to measure the current through the resistor. Looking at the jerky needle movements now, I suspect that this might be bad practice. You should probably only switch at zero load. Later in the last experiment where I use 1000 volts, I get it right luckily. The seller of the resistor box warned me that the 100 giga ohm one might be broken, so I'm not surprised about the result at all. However, this little guy has a power rating of half a watt and to generate that power you'd have to apply 223 kilovolts. That's highly unlikely, I think. It'd be much more reasonable to assume that my test setup was faulty. So let's try something simpler, as suggested by a Reddit user. The Fluke 87 DMM has a nano Siemens range with a maximum resolution of 0.01 nano Siemens. And coincidentally, 100 giga ohms equal 0.01 nano Siemens. But the accuracy in this mode isn't on my side. It's plus or minus 1% plus 10 counts. So this reading could mean anything between 10 giga ohms and open circuit. Not helpful at all. The next best idea is based on this subtle paragraph in the datasheet of the resistor. It says that these resistors require extraordinary cleanliness and that if cleaning should be necessary, isopropanol alcohol should be used. Thing is, there are a lot of contaminants out there which will happily stick to the surface of the resistor and most of them will influence its resistance. So let's go ahead and take care of that. And don't forget to smell everything thoroughly. Ha <laughs> ha. 
I've prepared a small container of isopropanol alcohol and a pipette and with that I'm lightly pressure washing the resistor if you will. I want to wipe down the acrylic plate between the two banana jacks as well. For that I'm going to use dish soap in water. But sadly, I'm getting the exact same result as in experiment one. I have a feeling that this video is getting a little bit long, so I'm just mentioning this one for completeness sake. Whenever really high sensitivity is required, it is a good idea to use a shielded can with triaxial cable inlets for your experiment. Neither do I have triaxial cables, nor does the Keithley 410A have a triaxial input, but I happen to have an old aluminium enclosure with a BNC inlet. And that should be suitable for keeping most disturbances out, I think. I packed my bag and in it I put a 9V battery and a 100 giga ohm resistor. For the better part of my life I believed that batteries were pretty damn clean voltage sources, but apparently that is not necessarily true. Voltage noise from chemical batteries is a real thing, but probably not in a 100 giga ohm load scenario. Nice. Well, we are getting close, apparently. One more to go. This final attempt is based on something from the datasheet again. Voltage rating, 1 kV. That is something that I can actually supply.
thanks to the high voltage option on the back side of this adjustable voltage source. I ditched the whole EMI shielding idea again, because what difference will a few millivolts make in the presence of 1000 volts? Just checking that nothing blows up on the highest range. Nothing does, thank God. This time I'm ramping down the voltage all the way before switching the microammeter range to avoid overloading anything and to avoid those jerky needle movements. Quickly checking it with Wolfram Alpha. And there we go, right on the money. Putting it all back together is the easiest thing in the world, of course. Just trying to leave no contaminants behind and it'll be fine. And it still works perfectly inside the newly cleaned box. Great! And here's a demonstration of the sensitivity of the picoammeter. Alright, that's it, finally. Thanks for watching, see you around soon.